Are you okay? Yeah. <laughs> Good evening. I'd like to call the um, <clears throat> April 25th school committee meeting to order. We're going to start with public comment. Is there anyone from the public side who wants to speak? Okay. Uh, we have a consent agenda. Um, so does anyone want anything removed from the consent agenda? Move to approve the consent agenda as presented. I second it. All those in favor? It's approved for a zero. Reports. We have no students tonight. Any liaison or committee reports? Not for me. <coughs> the Wilton Advisory Committee meets again on May twenty, May fourth. Sorry, the Thursday, the first Thursday. Uh, if town meeting isn't still going um, and at our last meeting we discussed the ongoing restructuring and we uh, formed an additional restructuring subcommittee anybody that's interested in participating is welcome seven to nine on Thursday the first Thursday of every month at the police station I have a couple um, <clears throat> The, um, we have a school committee liaison to the Reading Community, community Televi Television, RC, I'm just gonna say RCTV board. Um, it's John Carpenter, and he recently was appointed to that board as a board appointed position, so he can no longer be the school committee liaison. So we have a vacancy there. Um, we traditionally, in June, look at all our liaison assignments and uh, readjust them. So I reached out to uh, Phil and Kathy at RCTV, and they were fine waiting a few weeks. So just a heads up, we have a vacancy on the RCTV board and we will need to fill that, but we can have that broader discussion with all of our vacancies. Um, also in those discussions, um, they're planning to come and do their annual presentation at some point over the summer, so we can expect a presentation from RCTV then. Also, at last night's um, town meeting, we were able to successfully, as a town meeting, transfer complete ownership of the Oakland Road parcel of land to the Board of Selectmen. Um, <clears throat> and so this is gonna kick off a public process where they're going to look at the best use of that land. Um, there's discussion of selling it, there's discussion of selling it for different uses, um, and there's definitely some interest in town meeting for open space uses, a park or trails or whatnot. So the one thing that we know is it's gonna be a very public process and the reason I'm bringing it to school committee is that land abuts the school campus. Mm -hmm. So I think we have a vested interest in that public process. So I would encourage um, us all to kind of keep it near to the ground and find a way to be involved in that um, moving forward. <clears throat> and finally, Friends and Family Day is sep uh, September, mm -hmm. June 17th, from 10.30 to 3. Last year, Linda and I manned the booth and um, I guess I just wanted to feel out the committee on whether or not we want to do that again. I think it's a great way for us to have informal conversations with families and parents of young kids. So I am available. I'll be doing the booth with the Human Relations Advisory Committee too, so. I should, I should be available, but I only have uh, one baseball team here. <laughs> Son is officially 13, so uh, the morning should be clear. Okay. I'll be available too. <coughs> Wonderful. Well, then let's get a table and um, we can work out the details of who. I'm also available that day, so it sounds like we'll have good coverage. That's all I had for reports. I think the committee is good. Anything from that table? Point the first count. First, I just wanted to publicly thank the families that made a donation your program it's always nice to see that type of generosity and it really helps support our programming in the summer last year we used the funding to bring in a fun um, program for the students at the end of the program so this is just a wonderful um, donation from these families um, so as you know we made the decision to appoint Kelly Bostwick as our new rise preschool director Kelly has been a team chair in the district now for three and a half years I believe mm -hmm. Um, she's currently the team chair for Birch Meadow and Wood End. She served this year as our lead team chair and took on a lot of leadership, so I'm excited to move her into that position to be the director of Rise Preschool. She has a phenomenal reputation with our families <coughs> and with our staff, 
She also really understands the transition from preschool to kindergarten, which is something we very much need to ensure that that continues to be a smooth transition for our families. So that's um, an excitement for us and a great opportunity. And um, we're happy that Kelly is gonna stay on with us um, and continue to grow professionally. Um, today, I also sent out um, an email to families about some of the changes that may be happening in our team chair positions. As we all know, there was a 0.5 reduction in the number of team chairs, and I'm not sure all of our families are aware of that. And so I am working on what that's going to look like, but I wanted to let them know to be watching for those changes. Uh, so that went out to families today via email. Um, Thursday <coughs> morning, we are having a um, coffee and conversation um, with RISE parents, and Kelly Bostwick will be joining that. We sent a notification to those families as well. It's also on my website, um, that information. Thursday evening, we are having a presentation. It's not a CPAC business meeting because it is town meeting. We are having a presentation at 7 p.m. by two of our school psychologists in the district about what their role is and what type of evaluations they do um, because a lot of families have questions about the difference between what type of evaluations we do in schools versus a neuropsych evaluation. So um, Dr. Kim Bernazani, who works at Parker Middle School, and Dr. Florence Johnson, who is our district-wide school psychologist, will be the presenters, um, and they'll be able to answer questions and, and kind of talk a little bit with families. So um, Thursday, I'm also gonna be presenting to the Joshua Eaton staff at their staff meeting, so I'm continuing to work with them. I, I think I'm there probably every week at this point. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm presenting at one of their staff meetings um, to talk about a little bit more about special education and inclusion. Um, and then a follow-up will be Monday, May 8th. We're having Alan Bloom, who's a retired um, professor in special education, along with Adam Hickey, who is our um, consultant from Landmark, will be meeting with all grade levels at Joshua Eaton to sort of help them understand kind of the IEP process as well as working with students with language-based learning disabilities. And I think that is it from my office. Great, thanks. I can give a really quick update um, just about the Friday before break. As you know, it was an early release day for students, um, but that all of our staff stayed that afternoon for some in-service professional development time. Um, and that looked a little bit different at each level. At our high school level, um, teachers were mostly engaged in curriculum work by department, especially some of those departments um, that were working on some of the things about the course or the uh, level consolidation. So they were beginning some of that, or continuing some of that curriculum work there. Um, at the middle level, they worked on um, actually sort of had a collaborative sharing sort of with an un unconference model if some of you are familiar with that where they had sort of um, ahead of time um, identified particular topics that people really wanted to dive into and arranged it by each building where they were able to share and give presentations and top uh, conversations and things around those at the elementary level we had several things going on the two largest ones um, were the core classroom teachers grades K through two um, were part of a professional development in service on the um, assessing math concepts. If you might remember from a previous um, presentation we gave about the new um, common assessment that we're using. Um, so we're kind of taking some next steps um, with that. Um, that was done by our math coach, a couple, a couple of our um, uh, elementary principals and then grades three, four, and five um, had an in-service around writing and writing workshop, um, both to sort of prepare also for you know the coming weeks, but really all of these at all three levels are already kind of looking ahead to next fall and what we need to be working on <coughs> to be prepared for that. Um, and just really want to express our gratitude and commendations to our staff too, because I mean, it was a great afternoon. I'm hearing good things from people the Friday afternoon before break is probably, you know, not the best time. Um, but as we are looking ahead to next year already, it's spring, we don't have a lot of opportunities to do that. And so I really think they made the most of it and worked hard. And so that's what was happening this <coughs> afternoon. Thank you. I have just one on extended day. So I'll wait for you 
the chat then. I have a few items. Um, I wanted to report out to the committee about um, the religious holiday uh, accommodations and some of the teacher and the student uh, attendance uh, surrounding those holidays. But before I before I get into the the details of that, um, it was it was an interesting challenge this year, and I believe at one meeting, um, Linda Snow Doxer brought up with with the um, the scheduling of the holidays in addition to all of the other activities that happen around April vacation um, and this year was a little bit more challenging because of MCAS as well because MCAS had shifted a little bit so we had the scheduling of MCAS we had some major overnight field trips that were going on both at the high school level and middle school level we had kindergarten screening uh, we had arts fest that was uh, rescheduled um, around the, the, the holidays um, and we have uh, we have April vacation so the the teachers did a remarkable job being able to schedule different classroom events projects homework all of the different pieces around all of these different events that were happening um, so uh, the the accommodation policy was in full effect and um, we spent a lot of time communicating to staff and, and to administrators on um, what the parameters were and what that looked like and, and talking about the policy. Uh, in terms of uh, absences, the, these two religious holidays, Passover and Good Friday, are probably a little bit different than um, the holidays that occur in the fall. Uh, where Passover, you have uh, the Seder suppers, which are more of evening events, Good Friday, uh, some of the um, religious religious pieces are not happening until the afternoon, so I, you're not going to see as widespread of absentees. Um, I think what we did see because of the Friday before vacation um, and the fact that it was an early release day, you probably saw we saw a higher rate of student absences um, wrapped around the the vacation, you know, the Friday before vacation, and we did have a, uh, a higher rate of teacher taking um, personal days for religious observances on Good Friday. Um, when you look at it from last year, when we did have the Good Friday in, in March, it was, um, the attendance rates were much different. Um, but in terms of student, student absences, for religious reasons, they were almost minimal um, for both Passover. And um, we did see a little bit uptick on Good Friday, but I think that was more because it was the Friday before vacation. And then with staff, um, very similar, we saw very little staff absences on the Passover, uh, the first day of Passover, um, and on Good Friday, we did, as I mentioned earlier, we did see a little bit higher absentee um, for personal reasons uh, because of the Good Friday holiday. Um, so that's, that's pretty much the update on, on that. I don't know if you had any questions on that. I think your analysis is right. The Friday before vacation yeah. was certainly impacted, and I think from a student perspective, it's a Friday before a holiday, and it's an 11 a.m. visit. Exactly. I, I, yeah. I so mean, it, I think that I, did happen. I suspect next year when that holiday shifts to March, I think you're going to see numbers that look like last Agreed. year. Agreed. <clears throat> um, I do want to report out, we received a memo from the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education regarding the changes to the 2017 accountability reporting. As you know, um, we are going, we have this year a new state assessment, MCAS, um, Next Generation MCAS or MCAS 2.0 or whatever the, uh, they're calling it this week. Um, all of our schools have now begun the MCAS. Uh, several began before vacation. Uh, I believe uh, the last school uh, began today and that was, that was Parker. Um, <coughs> right now the literacy uh, assessment is going on at the state level um, for, for all schools. Math will begin later on in May. Um, and then science is at the end of May. But I think what's important to note is um, the, with the accountability system is because we have a new test, um, and this seems to be the test that we're gonna be having now for a while, is that the accountability system essentially <coughs> is starting <coughs> at baseline for this year. And so there will be no um, assigning of levels this year for any schools that have a participation rate above 90%. If, it <coughs> if a school has a participation rate below 90%, um, then they will be assigned uh, uh, automatically to level three. 
but no other school is going or district is going to have um, any assignment of an accountability rating uh, this year. So it's only based on the participation level. Um, moving forward, this will be the baseline year, and starting with 2018, there'll be a new accountability system in place, which the Board of Education is yet to take a vote on what it's going to look like moving forward, and it is tied into the new uh, federal Every Student Succeeds Act, um, which the federal government is still trying to um, translate as well, um, because we're also in transition at the federal level with the Department of Education. So there's still a lot of transition happening at the federal level, which is causing um, a pause in what the accountability system is going to look like at the state level. Um, but for this year, this upcoming year, with the current MCAS testing that's going on, there will be no assignment for levels for school any schools that have a participation rate above 90%. Does that <coughs> mean it, what, we, what they, the school currently has carries over? No. So there'll be no rating at all? There'll be no rating at all. Okay, the other question. We are going to receive information um, from the state, but we're not going to receive a rating. The other question I have is, uh, you know, we, we didn't spend a lot of time talking about the, the what you refer to as the MCAS 2.0, or mm -hmm. how does that compare to, I mean, we, we had, I mean, I don't know how many nights of presentations on park and yes. our park vote, and now that seems to have gone off into the, into the wind somewhere. Uh, and w what's the comparison of the two? So essentially the questions that are in the current MCAS 2.0 are very similar to the questions that we've had on park. Um, the company that designed the questions for Park Pearson yeah. is the same subcontractor that's being used by the state. The bigger difference um, that, that I'm hearing um, from uh, staff administrators in, is that there's more writing, which is always a good thing, um, and that we are going to receive much more detailed information on um, the areas aligned to the curriculum frameworks, whereas um, with PARC, they didn't drill down as deep as we used to have with the old MCAS. Teachers used to be able to take the data by each of the curriculum strands to identify question by question and identify you know how many students answered each question uh, pick you know whether it was multiple choice how many students answered each of the multiple choice um, how, how the students did on the open response questions how the students did on the the longer written response questions we didn't get a lot of that information with park but we're going to get that information again with this new MCAS so just that's one. Yeah, sure. and with the park I know we made it uh, an investment in technology mm -hmm. for that is that <coughs> yes so we're applicable we're still using that. yes it's an on it's a computer-based test okay. and eventually the high school the high school still is using the the older MCAS um, and eventually I believe it's in two years um, we're going to be going to computer-based testing at the high school as well thank you so will we get you say we'll get information back from the state regarding uh, our performance will that give us an understanding of where Josh Wheaton is relative to where they have been uh, all of the schools we'll get information about all the schools correct but I mean we'll be able to compare what where, where they were last year to determine like would we have gotten out of a level three I don't know if we're going to get that level of information that I'm not sure so, so we I don't really know I, it may be but I don't I don't know that for a fact I think a lot of the accountability pieces have not been finalized yet moving forward. I've certainly okay. read that they're looking at other components than just standardized test scores as well for Correct. accountability. So I think, I think they, the Board of Ed seems to be moving in a completely new direction. The, can I add to <coughs> Yeah, that? please. Um, <coughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, we're, I think we're still a little unsure. I think the actual scores for the for the test themselves, we'll have some comparability. You know, we can look back. But in terms of the levels thing, because there's a formula, as you may recall, over the four years and a certain percentage and extra credit points for a certain movement, I'm not sure the state's going to do all that in the same way. So that may be difficult. That's that's what determine. the Board yeah. of Ed still has not decided yet. I mean, it's just in terms of like ELA and math, we can look at the number of students' percentage in each category of that. But the rest of that formula might 
be absent or might look different? We can also, whatever information we get is going to be consistent across the district. So one thing we can certainly do yeah. is identify yeah. any areas across the district that are yes. outliers. So that's yeah. something we, and we can might continue. also get some state average info and things like that yeah. for some comparative things. But yeah. I have a question on this. Um, what's the time frame for getting those scores? I think it's November traditionally. Um, I think it may be earlier this year uh, because it's, it's an online component. Yeah, it should be. So I, I think we're going to be receiving them more in the fall, September, October. That's a great. Because yeah. the sooner teachers get it, the sooner, and the sooner that you digest it, the sooner we can use it. The only other uh, report I have tonight, um, I, I just want to highlight uh, that recently our uh, Reading Memorial High School bi boys basketball team and girls basketball team were part of the Coaches for Cancer uh, fundraiser for the American Cancer Society. And they were, they were part of 200 schools in New England um, that raised over $200,000. Um, my understanding is what happened is they, they ran uh, through games they had fundraisers at their games um, and specifically uh, worked with the American Cancer Society um, with advertising the, the events and uh, soliciting and raising money for specifically for this cause. So I just want to echo the work of the two teams and athletic director Tom Zaya and the coaches for, for putting the time and effort in doing this. And th there has been a lot of work over the years by all of our sports teams in raising money to fight cancer. I, I know our volleyball team um, has in the past done the uh, uh, Dig for Pink um, event every year um, to also raise money for breast cancer awareness. So again, the, it, our high school does a tremendous job raising money for, for this important cause. So I just wanted to recognize and thank them. Absolutely, thank you. I, have, I just realized that it would be good to also say I went to the elder services workshop um, last week and there were lots of nice things said about the collaborations with the schools the Joshua Eaton reading program that's done there and um, looking forward to they're trying to collect feedback to figure out what good services we're missing but good services that we already have um, and so looking to, to look for what kinds of programs and collaborations we might be able to do with the schools, with the seniors in town. Great. Okay, I think that's it for reports. Um, Dr. Doherty, we had talked about taking the extended day update out of order. Does yes. that still work for you? Yes. Okay. So we're, um, to, to everyone on the committee, we're going to take the extended day update and the discussion of the fee reduction outside of order, and then we'll do everything else I think, in order. For that, we also have, because we have the extended day director here as well, okay. so we wanted to... Thanks for being here tonight. Sure. This is a follow-up to the discussions we had during the budget process where we were going through looking at the revolving accounts. And this is also addressing some of the audit comments that came out two years, two years ago. Two years ago. Yeah. So included in the packet that we sent out is a proposal that we have been working on over the past couple of months to look at and address the balances within the extended day program. And what we are proposing to the committee this evening is to have a 10% reduction in the extended day monthly tuition rates across all of the various programs that we run. In addition to that, we also looked at and are recommending to double the current sibling discounts so we are recommending that we increase them to 10, 20, and 30% for the second child, third child, and fourth child. So that the 10% was really to give everybody in the program the discounts. And then we also looked at the sibling discounts and are recommending that we increase those as well. And what we did is we looked at the balances over the next three years to ensure that they are coming down. But what we wanted to do was put forth a proposal that one we felt would be sustainable as we continue to look to expand some of the options within the program. We're looking at items we can do 
with Mrs. Wilson for special education purposes. So we wanted to put forth something where we would bring the balances down, but that would be sustainable over the next several years. So we didn't come forth with a discount that we would then in a year from now have to say, ooh, we want to reassess it and have to potentially increase it. So we wanted to come up with something we felt comfortable. And what we will be doing is throughout the year and specifically on an annual basis as we go through the budget process, assess where we are against the projections and make any necessary adjustments in the outgoing years. But we felt this gave us a very good starting point and we also are monitoring because we do feel there will come to a, a point relatively shortly within the next year or so where we actually hit capacity as far as the number of students within the program so we're not projecting a lot of growth in the out years but that's something we'll also assess to make sure if we continue to see growth, we, growth we'll need to continue to assess these so we sort of looked at all avenues with this and felt that by increasing the sibling discounts would give families with multiple children a great discount as well as giving all families within the program the discount so included we've also which is probably a little bit small of a font but um, the, the current fee schedule for each of the various programs it's I'll call it a cafeteria plan where you can mm -hmm. choose which how many days, what type of program you want, what the current fees are, as well as the proposed fees with the 10% discount. The one item we are not proposing to change is the registration fee because we feel that that is appropriate to continue to charge that because then we do know the families applying for it are seriously applying for it. So we're recommending to keep that at the current $35 registration fee. Um, I have two questions. In terms of our tuition for this program um, compared to other programs, mm -hmm. um, how does it compare? And then the second question I have is, um, do we have adequate funds in our revolving accounts for those who struggle to pay for this program mm -hmm. but need the services? Yep. And so. I'm, I'm struggling with lowering prices given where we are sure. in our schools and want to make sure everybody has access. Sure. Um, so in comparison to other programs, um, so I, when I look at other schools, so for example, um, if you look at Wakefield um, Academy, they allow parents to pick which days they're coming month to month and they charge by the day. Um, if you look at Burlington, for example, they bus kids from one school to go to another school. So there's different things included in the fees for different programs. Um, Burlington also charges more for kindergarten children versus grades one through five. So um, you have that piece of it. Um, the other thing I think that you have to keep in mind is what's built into the costs. We do every Wednesday I offer, offer enrichment programs throughout the entire school year. So in our, our fees actually are, are in line if not lower than some of the other schools. We're not exorbitantly higher um, than anybody else. Our hourly rate is, a, is approximately $6.43 an hour. So it's really very minimal. Um, you know, I think um, it really depends on, you gotta compare apples to apples and I think that's hard when it comes to these, these programs. Um, as far as financial assistance, um, the way that we um, do the financial assistance um, right now is that we have parents, we have a process, so we have parents apply to the child care circuit first. Um, and the reason for that is, is to, you know, we have to have some kind of a protocol in place to make sure that, that parents, we don't have an influx of parents just, we've tried a number of different scenarios and this seems to be the best one to work for us. They apply the child care circuit um, and they, if they are approved, they may pay a, a minimal fee for, um, 
you know, the, the care and the child care circuit pays the other portion of it. If they're put on a wait list, they apply, they send a letter to Gail actually um, and requesting aid. Um, we use the free and reduced lunch as the gauge for that. So if they get free lunch, they don't pay any tuition. If, if it's reduced, they pay half tuition. Um, if there are extenuating circumstances beyond that, um, for example, if there are homeless children, if there are any other types of issues, we go on a case-by-case -case basis. So a principal may call me um, and say we have this situation. At that point, I usually um, go to Dr. Doherty and say, you know, is we have this situation. So we, it's we kind of collaborate on, is this okay? So we, we do. We've never not turn someone away because of a financial situation. So, um, you know, we have a number of different ways for families to come into the program. And we did look at that when we were looking at what we felt was the right reduction so that we can also continue to gauge that to see if that's working into the balance as well. So we did try to look at all of the various scenarios, which is how we landed at the 10% and then looking at how we anticipate the existing revolving account balance to come down because we don't want to end up in a situation where for those reasons we would have to turn somebody away. So we are comfortable that we have all the fail safe in place. Thank you. So <coughs> the reduction was pure, purely a result of the audit and not some other reason that it uh, it was because of that, and we have continued to see the balance increase. And even though we've been adding expenses because the program is the, the so sought after, we're getting goes enrollment up every year. And we're not yeah. able to keep adding more expenses. We've looked at the offsets we're taking. We've increased the offsets because we took a hard look at all the offsets we could take into the general fund. We increased those. Mm -hmm. And even looking at that, the balance itself was continuing to increase so in order to address the <coughs> issue of not having the balance continue to increase this was the avenue we went down but it was largely the result of the audit findings and knowing that they will be circling back to see how we're doing so addressing do you, it do you, with the reduction in the in the fees or the, the do you see a situation where you could get over subscription and have to turn people away because it's because um, we don't want that either. Well, it, it's it, it's an interesting situation because space, as you know, is a huge problem in the district. <coughs> a lot of times, parents will say to me, "Why can't we use classrooms?" And it's quite simply because at two forty-five, teachers are still in the classroom. So that part of the problem for for extended day is. We have to, there are some schools that have a wait list already that we just simply can't, we don't have the space. And so, you know, I've, what we've, we're trying to do is figure out other options for that. And at the end of the day, I don't know what those are. Those, they're hard to come up with because of the space. You know, there, there aren't classrooms available for us to use and there aren't, you know things like that for us to use so we're in the cafeteria and there's only so many kids we can have in the cafeteria at one given time um, you know it it, it it's a, a little bit different because of the, the ratio requirements and things like that that how many kids we have in the cafeteria and what's going on in the cafeteria and you know and it comes down to safety too you know you don't we don't want an out-of-control situation um, so that's really we don't want to turn anybody away but it's the space issue that's really the the factor so just one other thing so with and i don't know whether you can do it or not and that you pro we probably don't have the answer tonight but i'm wondering whether we can earmark some of that revolving amount aside for potential capital needs because of the wear and tear that this program is putting on our uh, gymnasiums or classrooms or fields or are right. we segregating those costs now or are we just to the extent we can 
we are i do I, I don't know definitively i would need to look into it there is also a distinction between whether or not you can utilize revolving funds towards capital purchases it, it that's um typically capital purchases cannot be funded out of a revolving account i don't know the specific limits i would actually want to research that a little bit more but there is restrictions around what you can actually utilize the revolving accounts for but we are looking at scenarios if we can the other part we always have to be very careful of is so the parents are paying an amount to go into the revolving account for the extended day students we have to make sure that when we're utilizing those funds we can actually draw a very clear line to say that we're putting money back into the the school and it is directly related to the extended day so we also have to be cognizant of that and what we will usually do is instances where we can say it's benefiting the broader population we'll look to try to split the cost to say okay we can actually take a, a, a portion of it and say extended day should do it but some of those where it might be wear and tear is a little bit harder to say that's fully attributable to the extended day population so the, it, it there it is we do have to be careful with it because the regulations around what you can use the funding for are pretty strict. I think it's we, certainly something we should be we, looking at we, because, I mean, our fields are, I mean, you look at like Turf 2. I know, I'm not saying you use that, but yeah, Turf no, 2. Yeah, no, I know what you mean. Right, yeah. from <laughs> day, sunlight to, to, to midnight, mm -hmm. that those that's getting used. And, you know, we're looking to, you know, at some point have to replace that. Maybe these are places so, we So um, we do currently, uh, take an offset for use of school properties, um, okay. which does, that does speak right to what you're talking about. We do uh, take an amount for, to pay for custodial cleaning time, and we do take an amount for administrative time. Um, beyond that, you really can't use it for um, the, the revolving funds for anything else other than the expenses, the direct expenses of the program. So we do, we do take an offset right now for use of school properties, in which that, a piece of that goes uh, to the town core, um, as well as our um, school facilities. Thank you. Um, another question that you might not be able to answer now, but I'm wondering if um, some of the revolving account funds could help offset the cost that prohibit a, a population of our students who can't access the extended day now. So we have kids that come from Boston for our schools who wouldn't otherwise, because of the transportation challenges, be able to take care, take advantage of our extended day. And having them participate in our extended day would be a benefit for everyone mm -hmm. involved. And I'm wondering if that's one of the things you considered in terms of offsetting some of the costs of the transportation to enable some of our METCO students to participate in this program. And it's not necessarily a can you afford the program, it's a logistical issue around the transportation. Um, and I know that the costs for transportation from the Met METCO bu budget have become prohibitive, which wouldn't enable participation in the extended day. I'm wondering if that has been considered I have not looked no, at that piece to see if, because we do, I, I think we'd need to look at whether, we need to look at it to see whether or not I could utilize the funds in here to go towards uh, the, transporta a it'd be the trans transportation, it'd be transportation for that group of folks when we're not offering transportation to the broader base. And then it would be multiple forms of transportation because of the start and end time of this and we actually are running transportation for the bulk of that population it's definitely something we can explore i don't can't they utilize the late bus we have for for athletics now or or do we do we st i assume athletics. we still have uh, it's only that's se limited, it's seasonal it's, it's very limited it's, it's seasonal it's very limited on the on the late bus as well you also can't mix elementary and high school kids on the same bus right well so we, it, we could it, Oh, I thought There's no there legal reason why you can't. It. No. Legally, you can. But we can take that as 
as a takeaway. I, we I, could certainly I look, into, look it. into it. I don't have a. I just think it would be wonderful if it could enable our whole student population to take advantage of that your program. Mm. Yeah, we can we can take that over. Thank you. Yes, of course. <coughs> Uh, move to approve the proposed reductions in the extended day program fees beginning in the 2017-2018 school year. Um, I actually, can I ask a question? We have to. I just need a second. <laughs> second. Thank you. Now you Go ahead. Okay, now I can ask. <laughs> thank you. So, <coughs> so I'm. What is the timing that an answer needs to happen on this? because I'm really curious about the answer to the question. I'd hate for us to cut the funds that might enable. Um, I, I hear you that there's a, a concern about how many people, um, there's not enough space mm -hmm. for more, but that there's a level playing field that anybody could sign up is of interest to me. And so I'm wondering if we have leeway to investigate the answer before we decide to give away the money. Oh, sorry, to, to lower the rate. They, they need an answer because they're already signing up students for next year. We'll certainly research it and see what we can do. But once we decide we vote here, then it can't, then the, answer, the decision's made, right? You're, I think you're making an assumption that the amount of money that we're reducing the fees like by yeah. would definitely equate to the money right. needed to fulfill what you're describing, and I, that's a pretty big leap. No, no, no. I just want to know whether it's even possible. I have no idea whether it's. I, I don't think enough. one would impact the other. Yeah. I don't think they've been agree. skinny down to the extent. No. Of this. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I don't think one would impact the other. So and and I'm not sure it can be done. I. I I think we need to research it. I'm, I'm not sure it can be done. So I think that, you know, the, the Sandy needs to move forward in uh, signing up people for the program because they need to know what the tuition rate's going to be for next year. I actually had a question. It's not really a question, uh, but a clarification, particularly for anyone who's watching this at home. Uh, Dr. Doxer said something a while ago that was important. We're in a very challenging budget time and the optics of, or you're reducing fees. So I just want to clarify um, for anyone who's watching this that this program is completely self-funded. So no taxpayer dollars are supporting this. Um, and also, I think you did a very nice job, but I just want to reiterate Ms. what Ms. Dowd said. Um, there's a lot of regulation around how this money is used. So you have to charge a fee that covers the expenses, and it has to be directly attributed to the expenses of the program. So this is not money that we could be using in another way, for instance, salaries. That's correct. So I want to make that very clear. Um, and we are we are limited in that way in how we use it. But I, I think that concern about optics is a really important one. But I wanted to clarify that. Oh, yeah, Dr. Who, who pays health benefits for our, the full-time staff? Do we offer health benefits for? Our? Yes, we do offer benefits for um, full-time staff. And it depends, um, uh, to be honest with you. I know that it's been researched with the town. Um, <coughs> and, you know, I know there's been discussions about how that works because I have some staff that work during the regular school day that work for my program, so they're already benefited. Um, so it, it, it all depends on how many hours they're working for me and how many hours they may be working during the day and the combination, they can't go over 40. So they may already be benefited and they may Through be the town. Yeah. Yes, it would be and it's so the same split that how, how all employees. How does that work with the cafeteria workers? Do, does the cafeteria program have to sustain benefits? No. 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 Nope. It's all paid for out of the On accommodated cost, cost of the town. Huh. Just had a question. The theoretical maximum, I know there's different yep. sites and so forth, but we're up to 600 now. It's grown really rapidly, right? There's a 400 to 600 in just a couple of years, yeah. according to this memo. Yeah. Uh, so do you have a sense of what the capacity is for the program given um, your space yeah uh, what I so th generally the maximum in the afternoon um, at the elementary schools is, is 65 kids maximum in the mornings um, morning program is 45 so it's you know the, it's about 650 kids at the elementary school level we do not have a lot of kids in the rise program um, so 
you know, I base my maximum about 650 kids, basically, and, you know, that really is capacity. I mean, we, we have a wait list right now at a couple schools, so we, we have a lot of kids, um, you know, and, and I think that is probably a fair number, 650. And that's why, as part of this, we feel we're pretty close to hitting that maximum capacity, even we have the wait list even without having a, even without, a reduction yeah. in, the, in the cost. And the other thing I want to ask, maybe for Gail or Dr. Um, Darty, is it fair to characterize this as kind of complying with the law, right? That, that the reason we're reducing these fees is because we're charging parents for a service and can only use those fees for that service. And that if the, um, the balance that's in these memos, we see the pretty healthy ending balances here, pushing over a million dollars, so if we don't reduce these fees, we're in danger of taking more of people's money than we're legally allowed to, right. and we don't want to do that. So I just wanted to make sure that yeah. people realize we're just complying with the law here, as I understand it. We're not um, spending money by reducing fees, and there's you know, air quotes there, um, when we're looking for money in other discussions and other contexts, that this is a separate uh, discussion, a separate topic. To give you just a little bit of background, um, a year ago, uh, Ms. Dowd's predecessor uh, worked with the town accountant group, so this was sort of a two-phase approach with this. The first phase was, are expenses being charged appropriately? Why were the balances getting um, higher every year? And exponential growth in the program was the answer, was just it exploded. And I, if I remember correctly, and Dr. Doherty, correct me if I'm wrong, what um, Ms. Dowd's predecessor said was that um, staffing wasn't keeping up. We were getting this explosive growth. So step one was making sure staffing was adequate. So it was actually increasing expenses to accommodate the increased growth. Mm -hmm. This sounds to me like phase two, which is once you've done that, you've established enrollment, is steady and appears to be steady going <coughs> forward. You've established you have the right staffing and the right resources in place. Only then is it appropriate to look at a fee reduction. So I just want to give yeah, you that context. That's correct. This is the and second right. phase yeah. of a two-phase And as solution. part of the expenses, we also looked at the offsets that we were taking to make sure the offsets we were taking were appropriate. And as you've seen, we actually have increased those, especially mm -hmm. looking at use of school property, um, the portion that actually goes back to the town as well. So we also, we, it, that was part of looking at the expenses. So we, we did take a look at that, and this was the final phase of it to say we, we need to look at the fee structure because the expenses are not growing as quickly, even though we, we have mm -hmm. looked to add, especially on the spe special education side. So we feel that this is the next logical and appropriate step. And if I'm looking at the ending balance here projecting in 2020, it's well under a year's worth of expenses. So that yes. feels more reasonable yes. Yes. than right. what we have. So I, I appreciated the three or four year projection out to see that. Um, have we looked at the rental of facilities potentially? Um, I, I know, you know it might be logistically a challenge to, I guess, bus kids to a location. Right. I'm thinking like the, the location where the public library used to be. I don't know if that, something like that. And uh, again, uh, the only thing I'm thinking is YMCA's essentially do that. They'll pick kids up, right. bring them to a site, just throwing that up. Yeah, what, it, yeah I know we had, had talked about having something like that because of the growth of the program and so many kids and mm -hmm. having wait lists and everything else. Like how do we, because you don't want to <coughs> turn people away. Right, right. Um, you know, and that is something you know, and again, I don't, it's all comes back to what we can spend money on. And, and part of what we're looking at is the proximity of some of the elementary schools to, say, the middle school to say, can we, do we have space at some of our other locations here where we could either provide some right. form of exercise, walking from school to school with proper supervision, so Birch, or Birch transporting. List. Can we walk the kids down to Coolidge? Coolidge. Coolidge. Yeah. So we are, we, that's, that's Sort of the next phase, we're also looking at some of those options as, as well, and that might be if we need to do some of that, would we need to provide some form of transportation, which would increase expenses a little bit. So that's, right. we also over the past few weeks have been looking at some of those options, but that also comes with the challenge of staffing it up as well. So we want to make sure we don't overcommit the program without being able to have all of the appropriate resources in place. So we actually 
over the past couple of weeks have been looking at some of those options. I, I would understand that the logistics is definitely challenging, but I was just wondering if that was an option or something that had been thought about. So it sounds like you're looking at town-owned buildings as opposed to outside facilities. So I just want to clarify. So you, it sounds like there's still wiggle room. You're still looking at what options there are with if we were to take this down 10 percent, then it's not going to stop your problem solving in order to um, deal with the space constraints. No, and I, I think we're always open to suggestions, you know, to, to with the program. I mean, it, every year we go through different things with the program and how, how can we improve it and how can we change it. And that's, I think, the beauty of the program and why it, it's hard to come up with an exact, you know, formula for the program, too, because we do change it every year. We always say, okay, you know what, we're going to do this differently. And I think we're always open to suggestions on how we might do something better or, you know, change things. So, yes, you know, if you have suggestions, by yeah. all means, I just let me know. <laughs> part of the challenge with that is we want to make sure we don't recreate. I'm not saying it's a problem because this is a great problem to have where your program is, is sought after, where we have additional space. We have X number of new students enrolled, and then we bring in all of this revenue, but we build up the balances again because of the expense structure. So we're trying to make sure each of these decisions is also thinking short term and long term to make sure we don't address this and then sort of recreate it. Create another problem. Right. Yep. Yep. I just wanted to quickly say thank you for creating this problem for us. Oh sure. <laughs> <laughs> for making such a great program. Yeah. No, for thank great you. things. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I actually want to echo that. I have loads. I've heard a ton of feedback about the um, extended day program. It's universally, universally positive. It is so, oh, and good. not Thanks. only does it solve a need for a lot of families, and again, at not at taxpayer cost, it's a fee-based program. Um, it really solves a need for a lot of families, but um, it's just enormously popular with kids. Kids love it. So congratulations and thank you Thanks. for the work that you do. Thank you. Um, and thank I also would like... John had had his hand up. Oh, sorry. Know. If he's still oh, maybe not interested anymore. Sorry. <laughs> um, the other thing, um, oh, I lost my train of thought. I'm sorry. Are you ready for the vote? No, I have one more thing to <laughs> say. Um, positive feedback was the first thing. Fee based program. And the second thing was, oh, this is good news. This, I just want to point yes. that out. We should say that this is good news. We are making a highly needed and highly sought after program in this district more affordable for families. Yep. And I really appreciated the approach that you took of uh, lowering the rate for everyone, but recognizing that families with multiple children have exponential expenses and finding a way to double the impact, or not double yep. financially speaking, but you know what I'm saying, make it an even bigger impact for multiple children. So I uh, really thank you for the work well, that you're thank doing. You. Um, anything else from the committee or from the public? Mr. Arena. Dowd question. No, I think it's chapter No, we're not chapter seven. I think it's chapter seven. Again, this is an unscientific search. Just poke around in revolving funds for spend spending around the capital debt appears to be in some cases a lot. So you couldn't charge capital to it, but you might be able to spend say depreciation dollars to replace something. Couldn't buy the asset, but you might be able to take care of it. I think it's a great takeaway for further research, yeah. um, but we obviously need to make sure <laughs> we're looking at the right code of the law. Thank you, Mr. Arena. Anything else from the public committee? Are we ready for a vote? <laughs> All those in favor? It's 5-0. <clears throat> thank you, Gail, uh, and thank you so much, really, yep, Sandy. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Doherty, yes. do you want to walk us through, actually give us a minute to find it in the packet, your evaluation process? Yes. We're kicking it off tonight, right? We are kicking it off tonight. Much earlier, by the way, just so you know. <laughs> oh, I know. <laughs> um, so 
in the packet there is a memo that describes the process and then there is the actual <clears throat> summative evaluation template uh, which each school committee member will complete. Um, so first to, to walk you through the, uh, the process, this is the, the final step of the five step process that begins when uh, we have a discussion about the goals for the year, the superintendent's goals and the district improvement plan goals which were approved in November um, by the school committee. I uh, then heard a mid-year review uh, which I believe was in um, early March, late February, early March. Um, and then this begins the, the last piece of the process which is the, the summative piece. Um, this, this process is identical to the process that's done uh, with any licensed ed, uh, educator um, in the district or in Massachusetts uh, in, in a public school. Um, the one difference is that the superintendent is public um, and the other uh, educators are not. So that is the, that is the one big difference. Um, so if you look at the, the memo just very quickly, um, what and what I'm doing tonight is I'm just briefly going through the process on May 8th. I will go into it in a little bit more detail and include um, a lot of the evidence that you have already seen uh, throughout the school year um, at meetings and other um, means that, that you've received information from me. So what you're going to do is when you take a look at the actual summative evaluation, so it, it begins on this page here, and I will send this to you in Word. Um, so that it's easier for you to, to complete. So step one on this form right here, step one is the goal piece. And actually what you need to do first um, is, and this is where it gets a little bit confusing, so that's why I'm going to do it a couple of meetings in a row. Um, the goals are located um, on the page that says superintendent's performance goals, and I've already put in the goals for you so that you, um, and this is right from the district improvement plan, so professional practice goal one. Um, you can see there the description, student learning goal two, the description, and then there are, there are district improvement plan goal, which is three, and then I also put the four focus area goals on the next page. So we have focus area closing the achievement gap, focus area on literacy, focus area on mathematics practices, in the focus area in social emotional learning. So um, you check the boxes, the box one for each goal, um, where you believe the rating should be. Then you go back to step one and then just circle what you put um, in the other boxes. Okay? Any questions so far? Okay, then the Second piece, which is step two, is the performance on the standards. So that goes a couple of pages further. Um, and you can see here where it's a superintendent's performance rating for standard one, instructional leadership. You can see that there are four levels, ranging from exemplary to unsatisfactory. Um, and then you would check as an individual school committee member the box that would fit each of the indicators. So you have 1A curriculum, 1B instruction, 1C assessment, and so on. You would then give an overall rating based on what you have put for each of the indicators. So there's an overall rating for standard one. And then you would do the same for standard two, which is management and operations. Standard three, family and community engagement. And standard four, professional culture. Then you go back to the cover page, and then you put what you put on the other sheets, then you capture here in the summary. So you check off the box. And then you do an overall rating, which is the, I don't want to say average, because it's probably the wrong term, but what, um, based on what you put for each of the four standards, you would then look at those four standards and give an overall rating based on the score of each of the four standards. And then you would put your individual comments as, a, as an evaluator. So each school committee member will do that individually. 
and that is due um, by May 22nd. And then on May 20, on starting on May 22nd to June 5th, um, and this is something that the committee put in place several years ago, um, I will meet with each individual school committee member to discuss their draft. So you would send the draft to me by the 22nd into the chair or the chair's designee, whoever that would be. Um, and then um, based on those individual meetings, the school committee member uh, can either change their individual summative evaluation or they can leave it the way it is. And then that would become their final individual evaluation and then they would send it to the chair and or the designee who is gonna compile all the results. Um, that would be sent out the final compilation uh, which represents all of the committee's work. Um, that would be sent to um, the individual committee members and would be part of the doc, the, um, the packet for June 15th and then on June 19th is when the, the meeting on June 19th will be to discuss and approve the, re the final report. So the school committee would take a vote on the final report. That's on June 19th? June 19th is the school committee meeting. So all the work is done before then. Yeah, yeah. And in the memo, you've outlined And, and that's all in the memo. Yep. I just yeah. basically went through the memo with you. Any questions? So that, that's a brief, and I'll go into more detail on um, May 8th. So we don't necessarily need to get started on our work until the 8th. No, I just like wanted you to see it a couple times. Um, no, that's very I know helpful. some of you have done it before, but. Very helpful. Um, and just, I think you said this, but um, we each do an individual evaluation that does have our name on it and is posted to the web. It's a completely transparent and public right, it's process. Right, it's a public document. Um, and then the final evaluation, of course, that, that reflects the compilation of the committees is also. Right. Mr. Robinson? I'm just, so these are going, these are just historical documents back to 2012. I'm looking at an annual. No, that's part of a public uh, records request from one of our email correspondents. <laughs> <I'm wondering>. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah. I, right. I will send you, I will, se that's going to be part of the May 8th piece. I'm going to give you yeah. that information. Just a question about standardization across the state when people were interested in how our process is unique to Reading versus standardized across DESI for the whole state of Massachusetts. The, um, can, can you just briefly highlight, obviously the goals I've, are specific to, to your role and to Reading, um, but what are the other aspects that are common to all towns and- uh, This form is a DESI document. form. Right. So, so this, every, every superintendent goes through the same identical process. With the same uh, rating criteria, but they'll have their own individual goals, obviously. Correct. The focus areas are unique to rating that we have. They're not school-wide. Correct. School but, but the indicators and the standards are identical. And then the, um, the forms that we use are the forms that, you know, the, the four-step rating process that we have here in this kind of everybody on the school committee fills out a form and then we collect them at the end. That's a standard process. It's actually in the regulations. Right. Yep. Thank you. I just wanted to clarify that. And to give the committee um, some other insight, in the past couple of years, Elaine Webb has offered to do the compilation for the committee uh, very generously. I haven't had an opportunity to speak with her. She does a phenomenal job, so um, I will have a conversation with her. That being said, she's currently working with Mr. Robinson on negotiations, and I know she's spending an enormous amount of time here in this building outside of these meetings. So I, um, I'll have a conversation with her to see if she's interested, but I'm going to offer to do it in her stead. Um, if, if just for scheduling reasons. So I'll have a conversation with Mrs. Webb and we will know by May 8th which one of us is doing it. Anything else? No, nope, that's it, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Doherty. Anything from the public? Okay. Um, maybe we should do the capital plan because that's the only other kind of financial. Sure. The other two look a little more straightforward. This actually is pretty straightforward also. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, under uh, the regulations on the um, oversight of collaboratives, um, the school committees of each individual school district that belong to a collaborative um, have a few roles. One of the roles that they have is to approve um, 
a, a capital fund for a consortium for a for a, a special education collaborative, and then uh, a, a capital plan. So what you have in front of you, this is for one of our two collaboratives. This is the North Shore Education cons Consortium. Um, we have just completed their budget process, just so you're aware. Um, and so as part of their budget, there is, um, for the first time, the need for a capital fund. And you can see the talking points on why there needs to be a capital, capital fund for the North Shore Consortium. Um, pretty much they, unlike our other collaborative, the SEAM collaborative, they own most of their buildings, whereas SEAM rents pretty much all of their buildings. Um, so they require a capital plan to be able to, like we have, a capital plan for the town to upkeep their buildings. Um, so they need a, a, a capital fund to be approved, and then you can see the proposed capital plan on the next page um, that they are proposing for 2017 to 2022 um, in the major areas that are going to be uh, done um, in the different buildings. So um, the motion that's required tonight for the Reading School Committee and all other school committees that belong to the consortium would be doing the same thing, um, is to approve a capital plan uh, and then the, the establishment of a board designated capital fund. And just so you're aware, for those of you who may not know, I am on the board. Um, you voted me on the board um, uh, of the North Shore Education Consortium. So I attend the monthly meetings. I, um, and so I'm part of the, the other superintendents that approve the budget and um, the process for that. Yeah, Move to approve the capital plan of the North Shore Education Consortium and the establishment of a board designated capital fund for the North Shore Education Consortium. I'll second that. Second. Any comments or questions? I'm just curious how many members there are. There are, uh, there are 18, and then there's, if you include Tri Tritown, they're, they're three, so it's actually a total of 20. Okay. So, and how many board, how many uh, <coughs> members of the board of dire uh, directors are there? 18. Oh, so everybody that's... Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, okay. All right. The only question I had about this was answered in your memo, but I do want to draw attention to it. Um, given the discussion we just had on revolving funds, I was, in, I was concerned that there be a cap, but your memo clearly indicates that this fund will be capped at $650,000. Yes. Um, so that was the only sort of fail safe that I wanted to see, but I see that it's in here, so it seems reasonable and the capital needs seem to be there from the descriptions in the memo. Anything else? Are we ready for it? Are we ready for a vote? Five zero. Um, let's talk about town meeting. I want to end with the last day of school. Okay. It seems like that you should end with the last day of school. <clears throat> last evening, um, well, actually, I should I should back up. If you remember, um, when we went before uh, the finance committee. Um, when we were moving forward with uh, making adjustments to the, the FY18 budget, one of the pieces that was going to be taken out of the school committee um, voted FY18 budget was the $150,000 for science. And that was going to be uh, put as part of Article 5 at town meeting for FY17. So last evening at town meeting, um, town meeting did approve um, $150,000 to be spent by June 30th of this year uh, to move forward with phase two of the science implementation. Um, so essentially what that means is uh, we'll be able to move forward and encumber the funds uh, for durable goods, uh, curriculum materials, technology, anything that would be uh, directly related to um, the science curriculum implementation Primarily, it's going to be in two places, K to two and the high school. Um, is this next, this next phase? Um, so we're very grateful for town meeting for uh, voting on that last night and approving it, and then we can move forward uh, with with that implementation. Next Monday night is 
um, the, the budget for both town and uh, town departments and schools. Um, and so the, the plan is, is that um, Ms. Borowski will be doing an introduction to the budget and essentially the presentation that I did at the finance committee meeting um, will be very similar to what will be at town meeting. Um, there'll be some minor changes, but nothing uh, significant, and I'll make sure that we send that out to you uh, in advance. Um, what we did last night also, I should back up, what we did last night also at town meeting, and we also did send to, to through Laura Gem to all the town meeting members was the question document that has been put together by Mrs. Dowd um, throughout the entire budget process. We also made paper copies for town meeting members last night at their request. So last evening, town meeting members were able to get the paper copy, and prior to that, um, if they were on the distribution list, they received the electronic copy. So that, that is all of the questions that have been asked from the very first meeting that we had in January um, and until actually re most recently uh, when we received some other questions. I know it was an enormous amount of work. But I know a lot of people in the community read the questions and answers and appreciate it, so thank you. Anything else on that, Dr. Brown? No, that's it. I think we're ready for the next motion. This is one of my favorite of the whole year. <laughs> <laughs> Move to approve June 20th as the last day of school for the 2016-17 school year. Second. 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 Anyone who wants to argue with the last year of school? All those in favor? Five zero. Ah, oh, that's exciting. Um, <clears throat> I think that's it for our open session agenda. Do you have anything else, Dr. Doherty? I do not. The committee? Nope, nothing. All right. Um, I am declaring that at this point an executive session is necessary to protect the bargaining position of the board um, with regards to collective bargaining. Move to enter into executive session to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining and approval of the minutes not to return to open session. Second. Dr. Nine? Second. Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> Mr. Plavitt? Yes. 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 yes.